Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. May peace be upon you. This is Edward Ahmed Mitchell welcoming you to today's uh, episode of Muslim Network TV. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be discussing the Turkish elections. Uh, I think this is something that many people across the world, inside and outside the Muslim community, were watching. Uh, and we're going to discuss the election results, some of the surprises that uh, we saw, and uh, what might be happening in the next two weeks in the lead up to the runoff election. Uh, to get some perspective on this, I want to welcome on our special guest, uh, Mustafa Akil, who is, many of you know, an author uh, and journalist and a senior fellow with the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. Uh, Mustafa, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Uh, I'm fine. Thank God. And hope you're fine, too. And Hakul. greetings to our uh, viewers. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. So uh, first, just some background info for us. Right? I think everyone was a lot of people were following it, but a lot of people don't know how the Turkish election system works compared, for example, the United States. Can you give us some background on how the Turkish electoral system works right now, um, what people were expecting to happen uh, in this election, and then what, what actually did happen? Just some of the facts for us. So we're all aware of the, the recent news. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Turkey is actually an exceptionally good, uh, has an exceptionally good system compared to some other countries in the region. I mean, we know in the Middle East there are many authoritarian regimes where either elections don't take place or where you always know the dictator will always win. But Turkey is a, has a functioning democracy since 1950, at least it goes back to late Ottoman Empire too, uh, where vote count is decent and, and, and competitive. Uh, Turkish democracy is very turbulent. Sometimes parties act in an authoritarian way, as, as we're seeing, I think, in the past 10 years. But when it comes to the vote, people vote because they believe in it. And uh, Turkey is a republic, which used to be a parliamentary the, uh, republic, turned into a presidential system uh, under Erdogan, where too much power got concentra concentrated at the hands of the president, if you ask me. Uh, but Erdogan's, President Erdogan's ruling party has been winning elections since 2002, so they seem to be winning this one too, although there will be a second round in, uh, in less than two weeks now. Yeah, and it seems a lot of people were surprised. I think in the Western world, and it's no secret that in the United States, I think many journalists and politicians were hoping that President Erdogan would lose. Um, but it seemed the polls locally seemed to show that he, he might not make it, and yet he not only survived the first round, he, he almost uh, won it outright. You know, what do you attribute that to? What, what do the numbers show in terms of where he got his vote total from versus opponent? Well, what do you think uh, your analysis is on how he managed to pull off this uh, surprising almost victory? Too many people it came as a surprise to many people in the West, too. I wasn't too surprised because I was seeing that the polls show it's a closed race. So it could go both ways. And, you know, polls are always a few points back and forth. So you can never be 100 percent sure. Uh, there are now, uh, I mean, the opposition are saying there are some irregularities. It just came as news. I don't know what will come out of that. But it is clear that Erdogan kept his mandate uh, by and large. His party and, and the support and the bloc, or the ruling uh, Republic Alliance, as they call it, Republican Alliance, they, they kept the majority in the parliament and Erdogan seems to be the number one. I wouldn't be surprised if he wins the next round again and be the leader of Turkey in the next five years. So tell us a bit about the, the tension in, in Turkey, because it seems there's um, obviously the, the, the economy is having some trouble, the earthquake. So all those kind of recent developments. But it seems some people are saying there's a, a longer and broader tension between kind of uh, Muslims, devout Muslims, seculars who don't really um, want Islam in the public sphere. Can you give us the history of Turkey and some of the back and forth between dictatorships and yeah. elected governments and how that might be contributing to the tension and, and the close division we're seeing in the politics? That's a very question because I think the current political discussions are really deeply rooted in that long history of Turkey. This, the story short is that Turkey was the Ottoman Empire, a part of the Ottoman Empire, you know, which after World War I, Republican Turkey was founded under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And Atatürk imposed on Turkey a very staunch secularism that I am critical of, right? I mean, it, I believe in separation of religion and state to protect religion also from state encroaches. But it was not just that. I mean, he closed down Islamic institutions like medrasas, Sufi orders. Ultimately, his followers banned the hijab in public spaces and public jobs. And I've, I'm very much against that. I should make that clear because, you know, people wonder where you are in Turkish politics. I've been a big critic of Turkish secularism. 
Turkish conservatives, religious conservatives, uh, sometimes said we are against this kind of secularism, but we would prefer the American style, where there's more respect for religious freedom, right? So, I mean, I, I, I was coming from that perspective. So Erdogan ultimately defeated this secular system and brought religious conservatives who were pushed down, pushed out of power to power, right? So that that's main his main story and main success. And I think that was a good thing. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that. But in the first 10 years of his rule, this looked like like he's bringing religious conservatives to to equal rights with everybody and you know, he's making political reforms and economic development, that's all good. But then out of this success story, he himself, if you ask me, began to turn authoritarian, controlling the media, punishing journalists who are critical of him using state resources to just support the people who support him, but also empowerish other segments of society. So it started to look like Turkey is going from one hegemony of the secular people over the conservatives to the other way around, right? This time, conservatives who support Erdogan became the new ruling class. And there I began to have my own criticisms. And a lot of the conservatives in Turkey are still uh, religious, pious people, if you will, are still with Erdogan. But also there have been people who founded the AKP together with Erdogan and saying that, well, we established the party with good, good ideals, but there's there's now corruption, there's nepotism, power corrupted us, and we are becoming opposition figures right now. So that's why two important figures in Erdogan actually joined the opposition uh, block in this election. So I think Erdogan does cash on the historical fact that, yes, he brought religious conservatives to power, but also it's not just simply today religious people one side and more secularist people on the other side. And the secularist camp, if you ask me, at least in the leadership of Kulishtarol, admitted that their past mistakes. They, they said it was a big mistake to ban the hijab, but were respectful to people. So I see some good development on the opposition side, but it still wasn't enough to really turn the major tide in society. And, and tell us about the other side, because there's a lot to discuss about President Erdogan, but tell us about the CHP and kind of their history, because what, what I kind of heard anecdotally was a fear that that sort of staunch secularism, that almost French style, excluding religious public space, would slowly make its way back if they won. And I don't know if that's a, a well-founded suspicion or not, but tell us about the other side, the, the uh, President Erdogan's opponent, you know, what was he arguing for and, and, and how is he different in any way from some of that extreme secularism uh, that we'd seen in the past in Turkey. It was French style. It was worse than France. So Turkey was, yeah. actually France looked more liberal than Turkey on, uh, under the secularism we're speaking about, the Kemalist secularism. Um, now, CHP is the party that historically has been associated with that, right? So there is that baggage. And, and then I myself never voted for CHP for my whole life until maybe in the past one or two elections, just to balance. Uh, so what, what I would say is, Yes, CHP is coming from that, but CHP ultimately realized that by doing this, they're just alienating a big chunk of society. That secularism was not just championed by the <clears throat> CHP, but also by the military, which was a big force in Turkish politics. The military has been swept to the side, which is a good thing. We don't need military in politics. Now, and CHP grow growing realized that that was stupid for them too, and it was in fair, unfair and unjust too. So we see a clear, uh, we did a big, big mistake. You know, we want to embrace everybody. CHP has now MPs who are wearing hijab, or at least, I don't know if they won this election, but they had some people who ran for CHP wearing the hijab. So this idea that CHP will come back and uh, take Turkey to the back, the, the dark days. I mean, Erdogan can't promote that idea, of course, but I think that's never going to happen because that kind of secularism doesn't have a big, popularity in Turkish society. It was imposed by the military, despite uh, it has a little, little support in society. And it's important that the CHP allied itself with, well, five parties, all of them are more right-wing than CHP. Three of them are very Islamic, if you look. So these are in, these are in the opposition bloc. Saad, that is Saadet Partisi, Gelecek Partisi, and Deva. Uh, there is also a kind of center-right party, E party, Turkish nationalist, but tilting towards center-right. So I don't think those dark days of illiberal authoritarian secularism will come back to Turkey. I think that's passe and that's a good thing. But whether we will still have a more pluralistic, free, open Turkey is, is a different question. And I'm worried that uh, the, the people who were oppressed in the past are becoming the new ruling class who are also now oppressors.
So what are your thoughts on the next uh, two weeks in the, in the upcoming runoff election? I mean, it seems like the, the bet is that President Erdogan will win re-election, given that he was, I think, two million votes ahead. Um, and then the broader question to ask you, you know, it seems that President Erdogan is very popular outside of Turkey. I mean, he, he almost won in Turkey, but even outside of Turkey, um, you know, it seems many Muslims, uh, you know, are rooting for him and, and seem to appreciate some of the care that he has given, at least in words, to Muslims who've been oppressed, Islamophobia. Do you think that there's anything other Muslim leaders around the world could learn from him in that way? I, I understand you've got some criticisms about how he yeah. handles things internally, but do you think other Muslim leaders around the world could learn something from President Erdogan in terms of respect for elections, allowing elections to happen, and also speaking up for the plight of Muslims around the world? Well, one thing to learn from him is, of course, join the democratic game, be successful, bring services to people. He was very great in, in municipalities. I mean, he began as a mayor of Istanbul, who did pretty well, which was a part of his political success. And and, and that pragmatism is important. Uh, on in, in ter- When it comes to supporting oppressed Muslims, that's true. Uh, but I'll tell you that uh, Erdogan, for example, used to be the defender of Uyghurs. We are now who are now going through a genocidal persecution in China, but he hasn't said much about the Uyghurs in the past set, six, seven years because he's been strategically tilting towards the Russian Chinese axis away from the West. Uh, the West is, uh, has own problems, and there is Islamophobia, of course, to, to criticize in the West, to condemn in the West. But China is also pretty Islamophobic, but we have not heard anything from Erdogan on that. Lately, a little bit because of the opposition, actually, opposition's pressure, Turkey is speaking up. You know, what I'm trying to say is that it's important to defend oppressed Muslims. It's, it's important to defend oppressed people everywhere. But sometimes politicians can be selective, right? I mean, you, can, you have a problem with the West, you can bring up uh, you know, Islamophobia in the West. That's good. But are you using this just on a matter of principle? Are you doing this because you're playing a strategic game? So I would have those things. On the other hand, I welcome Turkey's rapprochement with the Muslim world, engagement with the Middle East, Turkey's engagement in Somalia, uh, Middle East affairs. I think that's valuable. But I think that was done in a more pragmatic and principled way in the earlier years. It turned into a growingly personalized, erratic fashion. Turkey had an approach of not taking sides within uh, in, in the fights in neighbors, but trying to bring them together for peace, peace building. That was the earlier years of AKP. And I think that was more successful and more uh, that was a more principled thing to do. So question for you. Um, last question for you. And we'll let you go, uh, Mustafa. So in terms of um, the media coverage of the election, you know, it seems to me if I read an article about Narendra Modi or uh, Mr. Sisi in Egypt, the language that is used to describe them is markedly less hostile in the Western press than it is to describe President Aragon. I saw one article that just referred to him as a strong man and never mentioned that he's the elected president of Turkey. And then numerous articles call him an Islamist, this word Islamist, which um, I think many Muslims find objectionable. But the humorous thing about the word is I rarely see that word used to describe leaders of Gulf countries that uphold Islamic law and in a very traditional fashion. Yet that word is ascribed to him, uh, to the, uh, the Inahada party in Tunisia. You're a journalist and author. What are your thoughts on the use of the word Islamist to describe someone like President Erdogan? And also, do you see any bias in the Western media and how they've covered this election? I do see bias, um, but I also see that bias sometimes being taken to to the to defend Erdogan against perceivedly against all the criticisms who are perceived as unjust, unjust and unfair. But I don't think I agree with that as well. One thing you do you made a comparison between Modi and Erdogan. I think there's some truth to that. Uh, they're both elected. The, the the people want them. The majority want them. And both are championing a very majoritarian democracy, right? They win the ballots. They say, this is our nation. It's our values. I represent it. And it's good for the majority, maybe at least the more liberal majority. But for minorities, that's a matter of concern. Of course, in India, there has been lynchings, street attacks on Muslims. Thank God we don't have that sort of in Turkey. But in Turkey, there is legal prosecution of people who criticize Erdogan, people who are in the opposition. So there is that fear factor as well. Uh, Western media can be biased, and I see that I see that even more so in, in the earlier years. But also, we should not think that every criticism of an, a leader who happens to be Islamic or Islamist is unfair because they are criticizing it. Regarding the term Islamist, well, 
it's a loose term, right? I mean, there are terms like Christian nationalists. Who, I call Erdogan a Muslim nationalist or Islamic nationalist. But with the term Islamist is not too wrong in the sense that in Turkey, most people are Muslim. Like 90% of Turkish society would defend themselves as Muslim. But not everybody would say, vote for me because I, I have a Quran in my hand and I'm having my uh, election campaign in Hagia Sophia. Erdogan uses religious narrative to justify his rule. Uh, not everybody does that. Other people say we are pious Muslims, we respect it, you know, but, you know, we are not saying that God is on our side. Erdogan is saying that, so there should be a name for it. You can call it Islamist or something like that. In Turkish, we use the term Islamji versus Musliman. Most people in Turkey are Musliman, but not everybody is Islamji, and Islamjis are the ones who would quote the Quran for their political campaign. And is that a good thing? Should Muslims always quote the Quran and everything? Well, it should be. You should be careful about that. If somebody says this election is our Bedr or Uhud, uh, well, the guy against you is not the Mushrikun of of Mecca. So sometimes it turns into really exploitation of our sacred values of Islam. So politicizing them. Erdogan has that. It has growingly come to that point of view, and I think that's not right. But you would agree that the term Islamist seems to be thrown around in Western media in a way that isn't really consistent, I assume. It's not consistent. Who is Islamist yeah. or not? I mean, uh, the, the rulers of the Gulf who, you know, yeah. want people to obey them. Law, 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 they don't call that word. It's never used to describe, yeah. for example, Every, for example. I mean, Everybody is using different sections. I mean, Sisi is certainly the president of Egypt. The dictator of Egypt is using right. certain religion in the way that fits him. Uh, sometimes is the term Islamist is used only for Muslim Brotherhood or parties like that. Uh, in, in a broader sense, most political actors are Islamists. But I think uh, also there's a difference between having a political platform saying that we represent Islam, good Muslims should vote for us because we are good Muslims, versus, you know, we're serving the society with economic progress with this and that, and we respect religion, but we're not claiming to represent it right when you because when you say i represent it your opponents turn in turn to well then they're not the religious people they are the traitors of islam they're the enemies of islam that language enters in and i think uh, that's not a healthy thing and i think that look they may, that may look like oh this guy is very pious mashallah but it can also turn into exploitation of, of islam sometimes to cover nepotism corruption and some of the wrong things that you're doing really well, Mustafa, I want to thank you for coming to share your perspective uh, with us. Uh, thank you for your time. And again, the election is coming up uh, the next one in two weeks. So uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be watching inside and outside of uh, Turkey. Uh, we look for Turkey and we look forward to, uh, to learning more in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today. Inshallah. I hope whatever is good for Turkey, that will, that will happen and that should happen. Yes. May Allah grant uh, goodness for the Ummah and the world at large. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching today. We look forward to seeing you soon. Again, we'll, uh, we have, uh, the runoff lecture coming up in the next two weeks, so we'll have more guests on to discuss their unique perspectives on this. I know people have strong opinions all sorts of ways, so we look forward to having on more people to share their perspectives on what's happening in uh, Turkey. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.